we thank you for this time. Uh, we pray that this session will be edifying and that you'll build us up. Lord, I pray that uh, you allow us to go off script and uh, you lead the conversation. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So the, these chapters, you know, this one's Matthew 27, but the chapters at the end of the Gospels, they all get really, really slow, you know. Um, so it's a bit of a big one. And then next week's really tiny. You know, the last one is really tiny. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's do this then. Do you want to do the first paragraph, which is uh, yep. Jesus handed over to Pontus Pilate? Yeah, it's a big one, but it's in small sections, isn't it? Mm, yeah. So like, like, anyway, um, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders of, of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Yeah. So, yeah, Pontius Pilate was the governor. He was the Roman governor for, uh, you know, Jerusalem at the time. Uh, he was looking after that region on behalf of Caesar, really. Um, and they bound Jesus to take him to Pontus Pilate uh, yeah. under the charge of, really, two charges. The first one was um, that he was claiming to be the son of God, which they saw as blasphemy, and they wanted to kill him. But obviously, like, the Romans aren't bothered about that. They're not bothered about Jesus being, you know, the son of God. But the second charge they are interested in, which was that Jesus was claiming to be the king of the Jews because he was the Messiah. So therefore, because he was the king of the Jews, that would be punishable because of treason, because the Romans had already given them a king of the Jews, which is Herod, King Herod. So because he was uh, saying that he was a king of the Jews, which is what the scriptures were confirming, that's treason. And treason is punishable by the death sentence. And the death sentence is basically crucifixion. So they'd all plotted this out, you know, they'd all schemed it out. And they were basically taken into Pontus because of the charge of uh, claiming to be the king of the Jews. So they bound him, you know, even though he's God, they bound him up. Can you imagine God of the Old Testament being bound up? <laughs> and no, no, no. To yeah. Pilate? It's just like bonkers anyway. So yeah, we'll do where uh, Judas hangs himself. I'll do the first paragraph. Uh, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? <laughs> you, you see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. <clears throat> the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them in the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled that was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, whom they of the children of Israel pierced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Okay, so um, let's go through this then. So basically, Judas kind of changes his mind. He realizes that Jesus is going to be crucified and goes back on it all. So he saw that he was condemned and, you know, he must have known really that there was no escape for him now because he, you know, if he knew that he was the son of God, that's it really, it's the end of his life. So he became remorseful, uh, which is interesting because the word remorseful that I've highlighted, there's true, two Greek words for repentance. One is like a change of mind, but the other one is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, like a true repentance. Unfortunately, uh, the Greek is that he didn't really change his heart. He was just trying to find a way of escape, really. Um, so he hung himself. And uh, the first uh, scripture that you've got on the tab is Deuteronomy 22, 22 to 23. Is that right? Yeah. So got, so you want to read if that? A man, if a man has committed sin deserving of death 
and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accused of God. Is accursed of God. Is so, a, what did I say? Accursed, yeah. I can't he, remember what you said, but yeah, he's, a, he's accursed of God. So, uh, accursed of God. you know, he's like cursed of God sort of thing. Uh, you know, hanging yourself is just a bad thing to do because the scriptures say that you're accursed of God, which means that really, you know, he's going to really struggle with his salvation plan. In fact, there is really no salvation plan for him because he handed over the son of God. He hung himself, became cursed by God. And uh, really, he was trying to escape, but unfortunately, it wasn't really an escape because obviously when he died, he then stood before God, really. Do you know what I mean? I'm sure, or will do on the great white throne of judgment. Uh, then I've got highlighted that it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And this is the chief priest. They're saying, look, he's given us back the 30 pieces of silver, but we can't put it in the treasury of the temple because this is blood money. <laughs> so yeah, they, yeah. they knew that basically they had delivered Jesus over um, on false accounts. You know, they knew the, the sin yeah. that they had committed, and that's why they wouldn't even keep the money. And uh, together they bought instead the potter's field. And what's interesting is the scripture, Zechariah 11, 11 to 13. And, uh, oh, yeah. If you read it, mate, because I haven't got it without flipping through the Bible. I mean, you. Yeah. <laughs> so it was broken on that day. Thus, poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then he said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weigh out for my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that price the price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's related to uh, scripture, the way that Judas's death came around. Um, you know, Zechariah was asked to basically buy, take some money and <coughs> throw it into the potter's. Uh, and we end up with the potter's field as well. I think there's other scripture as well, like uh, Jeremiah 19, 1 to 13, but we won't look at it. But something. So let's have a look at Jesus faces Pilate then. Do you want to do the first yep. part? Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. <clears throat> then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Okay, yeah, so he asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Because that's the charge that they brought to him. You know, the chief yeah. priest was saying, this guy claims to be the king of the Jews, so you need to kill him, <laughs> basically. Uh, but we've got some extra scripture, which is interesting. Luke 23, 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The... Have, you got, have you got that? Yep. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king, a king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, um, yeah, so they that's the charge that they'll bring him forward to him, and that's why he was asking him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, It is as you say, which means he should die from Roman law point of view. You know, he is committing treason, and the only thing that Jesus said is, It is as you say, so therefore I deserve death. Um, and he was being accused by all of the chief priests and elders and i'm sure that they were just full of lies but the thing is jesus didn't say anything just like a lamb being led to the slaughter like the prophecy said and it actually made Pilate marvel greatly and the reason why is because 
if you stood before Pilate, you were probably going to die if you'd done yeah. something. And like most people would be really <clears throat> begging for their lives at this point. Yeah. But, but Jesus wasn't. So then we've got uh, taking the place of Barabbas. So let's have a look at that. I'll, I'll do the first paragraph yeah. since it's a massive one. <clears throat> now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release into the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him, saying, I have nothing to do with, with that just man. But I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why, what evil has he done? <laughs> but they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a turmoil was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, <laughs> I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. <laughs> yeah. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. They just okay, cursed so... their own children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Yeah, it's madness, isn't it? Uh, What's well, interesting about yeah. it is that uh, he's kind of like saying, "Do you want Jesus, or you do? Do you want the Bar Barabbas?" Barabbas is like this uh, nasty guy, and Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent, and uh, so did the, the chief priests. But unfortunately, of course, uh, the crowd chooses Barabbas. And was Barabbas, Barabbas like a terrorist, wasn't he? Was he like a? Yeah, he was. That yeah. political extremist. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting is that I think that Barabbas is like a picture of people having a choice between their sin and choosing God, you know, or choosing the gospel. And, uh, you know, everybody just seems to be choosing their sin. Very few people to choose the gospel. Um, so it was a bit of a dilemma for the people. But people, because we're generally evil, we just think about our own self, our own needs. And, you know, we choose the sin. We choose Barabbas over Jesus. So the reason why the governor released people like this is that it's really a hot, winning the hearts and minds sort of campaign, the people uh, of, of Jerusalem. You know, he's kind of trying to appease them. You like this person, or you like this person, who do you want? So they're trying to involve the people in justice in some way uh, yeah. um, by releasing, unfortunately, nasty people. So he said Barabbas or Jesus called the Christ so he said he called him the Christ like the savior the messiah the one that is to come and uh, the verse 18 says for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy so he was given Jesus this additional name this Christ name like as a as a prestige thing but he knew it he did that because he knew that the Jews were just handing him over because of envy the chief <coughs> priests so he knew it was about envy uh, more about the uh, religious leaders rather than about treason. Yes, Jesus said, I am the king of the Jews, but I mean, look at him. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's not wearing a crown. He's not coming in to evade. He's not taking over and all that. He's just living peacefully and not saying anything, you know. Uh, and then in verse 19, I've got highlighted. Uh, his wife said to him, have nothing to do with that man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. So he was, she was warned by God by proxy of his wife, his wife warned him by proxy, 
and uh, God can send us dreams and visions. So we should be mindful of them. Do you know what I mean? Like uh, when we have a dream, sometimes I believe that God is talking to us through that dream because uh, we see that all the way through the Old Testament and it's actually New Testament scripture as well. So they chose Barabbas, they chose their sin and they said, uh, you know, let Jesus be crucified, which is really weird because a couple of days ago, not so long ago, they were calling out Hosanna, liberate us, yeah. save us as he was coming in. And now they're saying crucify him. <laughs> it's like he it wasn't this guy that they thought he was going to be. You know, he was like healing people and all that sort of thing. But he was meek and mild. They wanted a liberator. They wanted the Romans out. And they, they were just uh, mocking him now. So it all swapped around, really. So he washed his hands and said, you know, I don't find him guilty. <laughs> So it's going to be on you. Again, a heart and minds campaign. Even though he knew that he was innocent, he still let them crucify him. So he was washing his hand to say, you know, oh, I'm clean of this man's blood. But like, that's not true, is it? Because anyone who hands over an innocent person to die, doesn't matter if you clean your hands, you're still guilty of the sin. Do you know what I mean? So... For example, like uh, he just handed over the innocent to be dead. And now I've got down here in brackets, abortion. Because like, uh, you know, children, babies, unborn babies are innocent. But we're killing them all the time. Do you know what I mean? Can we really wash our yeah. hands of that blood and say, you know, oh, it's nothing to do with me? I don't think we can really because we make that choice. So then um, he's got down there, sorry, highlighted, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. So he knew that he was just. But the justice of the past is that if the people wanted, you'd send them to be crucified anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's just like justice was crazy back then. Like, uh, for example, like um, if I was one year older, I'd be able to drive a minibus. But because I'm one year younger, I'm not allowed to do that. So like you could say that's age discrimination. And there's been many times in my life when I wanted to drive a minibus, but someone who's one year older than me can because that's the way that the law is. Do you know what I mean? That's just what happened. They didn't take the minibus licenses off people. They just said anyone that's born now can't have it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's just not very fair, really. Um, and like when you think about social justice, do you know what I mean, compared to Old Testament justice, I've got down here in Leviticus 19.15. Have you got that? Yeah. Do you want to read that? Hold on. I've got the... Oh, yeah, 1915, so I've got, I'm skipping ahead. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not You shall not be partial to the poor or honour the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your, judge your neighbour. So God's saying that it doesn't matter if they're poor... Or it doesn't matter if they're rich. You just you just do the same sort of justice. Do you know what I mean? You treat them equally, which is what's amazing about the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Old Testament law. It's like, if you do this, then you get that. It's not if they've had a bad life. It's not if they come from a different ethnic background. It's not if they've uh, you know done X, Y, or Z or whatever. It's just everybody gets the same punishment for the thing done. And uh, that's how it should be. But now we've got all this social justice now at the moment. Uh, for example, like um, some Asians are restricted from doing mathematics degrees because and, uh, they're, yeah. cause they're too clever. <laughs> yeah, it's like they, they've got these, um, was it, quotas, and they're, they're there for, to, to stop, um, it's to help people who, who are like from marginalised communities. But in doing that, they're... <laughs> <laughs> they're actually become what they what they're against. I know. They're holding the Asians down. <laughs> I know. Well, but, but this this is the American uh, definition of Asian, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It because yeah. our definition means like um, Middle Eastern, but their definition means like Oriental, doesn't it? Like. Yeah, I think their de yeah. definition is right. For some reason, the English have got it in their head that the Asians are Muslims. You know, it's all. Yeah, I know. Up. I know. It's all I think, up. yeah, that, that, their definition does make more sense. Yeah, it's probably because of our arrogant arrogance or something, you know, we've just not been interested yeah. in it. But yeah, so, um, and then there's some people that are allowed to get employment easier. For example, like if you're in the police force, 
laws and you have maybe an ethnic minority apply, there may be a bit more of a pressure to take that person because you want a more diverse workforce, which sounds yeah, but, great, but, but it's know, the definition but like, of racism. I know, but the, the, the problem with this, though, is like, if you're not employing the best person for the job, exactly, and you're employing fire firemen, you're risking people's lives. Mm, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 it's so it's so strange, you know. Did you see on the news the other day there was people throwing um, these petrol bombs into that bus? Did you see that in Ireland? No. Yeah, there, there was some teenagers and they lit some petrol bombs and threw it inside a bus. The whole bus burned <coughs> down. It had passengers on it and all that sort of thing. They they managed to escape. But yeah, there's there's anarchy all over the place. There's People dying all the time, people being stabbed. And we're concerned about things like social justice. Yeah, you know I mean, we've got massive yeah. fires going on all around us, all over the place. But I, I don't, I hate that term social justice because <laughs> what they advocate for is like, I wouldn't call that like justice. It's just like, um, it's like, uh, you know, they, they want these 65 different genders to be recognised. <laughs> like, mm. There's real things There's in the world, you know, like there's, there's like, a, like female genital mutilation. That is a real violation of somebody's human rights. You know what I mean? You could be mm. advocating for, for like women in, in the Asian community who are suffering, but instead you, 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 you're concentrating on something that's completely nonsensical. Like... Mm. Like, like any biologist will say this too. Sorry, I'm ranting now, aren't I? No, no, no. It's I feel easy. sorry for biology. I feel sorry for biology teachers. Yeah. They're treading on. Ink. They they can't say what is an obvious fact. That there's two genders. Oh. That they're not allowed to to say that this scientific fact is two genders. And any five year old can see it. But if you're a social justice warrior, you know. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bad times, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I know. The um, I don't know. Like that word Islamophobia came along, isn't it? Which is basically oh. you see all these terrorist attacks and you see all these bad things happening. Don't talk about it because otherwise you might be in Islamophobia. Do you know what I mean? Or don't don't comment about it. You know, be quiet about it. And the thing is, there's, there may be people that watch this video in the future and they say, "Well, it's easy for you guys to say because you're male and white." You know, talking about all these issues. But by definition, that makes you a racist if you say those things. Okay, exactly. Because like, a lot we of these people are things. guilty of the very thing they're accusing other people of. I know, it's madness. And the, um, I think uh, someone coined a new phrase called Christophobia, which is the idea that you're, you're sort of bad-mouthing Christians. Although the word of phobia means that you're scared of them. Like a Islamophobia, the I'm not scared of them. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's all bonkers. Like and uh, recently, it, it was a, I think it's. I think the words Christophobia is a silly word, but I would yeah. use it ironically. I yeah, would use yeah. it ironically <laughs> to make a point. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if yeah. they say you're Islamophobic, well, you're being Christophobic. You know. I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I went into a supermarket last year, you know, and there was this hot sauce, right? And it was called Christ on a bike. And it had a picture of Jesus Christ on a bike because, you know, the phrase Christ on a bike. Yeah. Right? So the idea is you drink this sauce and you say, oh, Christ on a bike, that's hot. But like for us, that's blasphemy. Do you know what I mean? Because you're supposed yeah. to be, be reverent and respecting God. And they put that out, like draw a picture of Jesus, put Christ on a bike, mock him. But can you imagine if they did it to the prophet Muhammad? Muhammad on um, a bike. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's just like it's one rule for one religion. It's, it's another a rule for it's another. A, it's a complete double standard, isn't it? It is. It's, yeah, it is. It's absolutely. all rubbish. Yeah. It's not based. You see, it, it, it's it's all. It's not based on like because they'll say, "Oh, it's about treating people like um, it's about equality," but it's not. It's yes. it's because they don't like Christianity, so you can say whatever you want. You know. Yeah. And you know, and the other thing is, right? If you bring this up to people, what we're saying, they will call you intolerant. Uh, yeah, Do you know? Yeah. If you point out this double standard, I, like if I point out this double standard, I'm the intolerant one. You know, when mm. it's you're obviously treating these two people differently. You know, you, 
it, yeah. uh, it's obviously a double standard but if you point it out then you, you're 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 being intolerant mm. <laughs> yeah. there's like lo there's loads of this stuff and i think the longer that you're a christian the more you see just how evil this world is but do you know, do you know it's, it's easy to get angry about this but but it's, it's it's easy to let this upset you but 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 what but what I, but I think what I have to, I keep reminding myself that like, you know, if you think about it logically, this world is like Satan's in it. This yeah, world, so so it would make sense mm. that this world that's ruled by him would be against you. It, it just makes sense. Exactly. So all, all of this is to be expected, isn't it? Like, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's totally to be expected. See, but when you look at it like that, it, 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 the anger kind of goes a little bit where you think, it oh does. well, it's to be expected. It does. It gives you peace, doesn't it? Because you know yeah, that you're it does. Just exactly. Through. Yeah. You're just passing through. Yeah. Yeah. And then I've got in verse twenty-five. It says, "His blood be on us and our children." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest, like I think we're all guilty of uh, crucifying Christ because the thing is, we've all sinned, and therefore He needed to die for us anyway to pay off our sins. So we put Him on the cross in that respect. Do you know what I mean? If he didn't go on the cross, there would be no payment for sin. And because we've sinned, unfortunately, he went on our behalf. So therefore, we had a part to play in it. Um, yeah. But I imagine that if we were there at the time, being mixed up with the crowd, one day we might be saying, Hosanna. The next day we might be saying, crucify him. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it depends. If you know Jesus really well, obviously you wouldn't do that. But I think that most of us just living in our life we probably would have been in the crowd doing the same thing you know. so then on the next page in verse 26 it says scourge jesus and you remember like the scourging with that they use with the pieces of metal and the leather straps yeah. and that thing by now his muscles would have been lacerated so he would have been struggling to move because of the pain like his muscles would have been ripped uh, you probably could see bits of his ribs, maybe. And I should imagine that his internal organs were probably not faring too well. So Jesus wasn't in a good state at this point because most people don't even survive. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people, many people don't survive scourging anyway. You know, so for Jesus to get this far, really, he's doing well. Yeah, but I, I think, you know, I'm well. not embarrassed to say this, right? If I went through what you went through there, I would have been weeping like a little girl. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and I would have been begging for my life, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think a lot of people would be, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's probably likely that you wouldn't have carried your cross there. They probably would have dragged you there, you know. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he chose the cross, he walked through it. Yeah. And then we got the soldiers, they went and mocked Jesus. So do you want to read this one? It's a big one, or do you want me to do it? I'll read it. I'll read it. Okay. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, what's that say? The pre? pre I think it's paratorium. Paratorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. <clears throat> when they had twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when, and when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put, put his own clothes on him and led him to be crucified. So they dressed him up like a, a king, like he was claiming, really. And they completely mocked him. You know, instead of a royal scepter, gold scepter, he had a reed which then smacked him with you know oh, yeah instead of a royal crown they gave him a painful uh, crown of thorns sort of thing on his head and uh, they just tried to make him look like a royal king really but uh, you know he was like he must have been completely battered and you know for them to spit on him and mock him and all that sort of thing it's just bad really yeah and then we've got the king on sorry no sorry I it's not my that yeah it's yeah. Okay, and then we've got the king on the cross. Uh, so I'll do the first paragraph. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Siren, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had gone to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of the skull, 
They gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divide my garments. They, oh, car carry on, mate. Oh, sorry, yeah. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. <clears throat> then two robbers who were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders said, He saved himself. He saved others. Why can't he save himself? If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe. He thrusted, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So it's just terrible, isn't it? Everyone's just mocking Jesus. And yeah. It's like really being completely dehumanised, isn't he? Like, <laughs> yeah, he is, yeah. So I've got high, highlighted about Simon. He came from this place called Cyrene, which was actually North Africa. And I don't know if you remember in the previous session, I said that the Jews would travel from all over the place to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. But because he came from the north of Africa, he was probably a well-to-do Jew sort of thing. So he came over and uh, he was carrying the cross for him. And they put sour wine mixed with uh, gold to drink, which is gold's like a really bitter substance. So it's like it's like giving someone a Coke, but filling it full of like, I don't know, something really bitter. And uh, it just tastes horrible, really. So they're just mocking him. They're just like mocking him. So they crucified him. And uh, crucifixion was considered the worst form of punishment um in those times really roman crucifixion because the idea is that how it works is like you uh you put on this cross sort of thing you sort of nailed onto a cross probably tied there as well and you're on this cross and um you start getting tired like because you, you're standing like this you, anyone that stands like that for a while is going to start yeah getting tired. And what happens when you start getting exhausted is your body will slump but when that happens you body pressure fill, goes onto your lungs and you start suffocating so you like you start suffocating after a while but what they do is they put a piece of wood under your feet and the idea is you sort of lift your feet up to stop yourself from suffocating because if you just go back you'll suffocate so you lift yourself up but then you end up with pains and cramps in your legs because you're tensing your muscles in order to keep yourself propped up so when you have that pain, you then slouch down and then you start suffocating again. And then you wake up and then you're back to the pain. So it's, it's a constant oh, cycle that, yeah. of a slow, painful death of exhaustion and suffocation round and round and round sort of thing. So it's, it's just terrible, really. It's a horrible way to die. Um, so, yeah, that's that. And they've got written above his head, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And again, they're mocking him like, they knew that he wasn't the king of the Jews. But the thing is, is that uh, Pontius Pilate is not only mocking Jesus, you know, because he dressed him up like a king and all that sort of thing. They're also mocking the Jews. Do you know what I mean? Because he is the king of the Jews. And they're like just saying, this is what you've done to him. You put him up on a cross. You've had him whipped and all that sort of thing. And you're guilty standing before. Because he must have looked up at him and it's like, <clears throat> hang on, the accusation says Jesus is the king of the Jews. And it's like, wow, you know, this is God, and they've actually done what they've done to him. So it's, it's just horrible, really. And they're also trying to make an example, really, to make sure that nobody else does the same thing. Now, it's interesting that they're looking up at the king that they've rejected, who is God, on the cross, uh, because I've got this other verse, which is 1 Samuel 8, 4 to 8. 
One Samuel, oh, I've got it. Four to eight, yeah? yeah? Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, <clears throat> you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge like all the nations. What was it? One to four to eight, was it? Uh, yeah. But the, uh, yeah, oh, no, I've got an advert. I've got an advert. Sorry, get off. But the thing despised, <laughs> despised Samuel, and and they said, "Give us a king to judge us." So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, "Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I shall not reign over them." according to all the works they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods. So they are doing to you also. Yeah. So like God took them out of Egypt, looked after them and all that sort of thing, gave them a load of rules to follow, gave them priests and all that. And they're like, we want a king. He's going to make up his own rules. We don't, you know, we want somebody else. We want a human to do it all. It's just madness. So they rejected really uh, God right at the start of the Bible as being a king. And then what's interesting is right at the end of the Bible, they're looking up at God who is the king and they've rejected him again in a really horrible way. Now, I think that the Old Testament, when God was like reign, you know, trying to reign over Israel because he was allowing them to do their own thing through free will. You know, he should have been reigning over them, but again, they're rejecting him. If he had have come down in bodily form, like Jesus, they probably would have killed him. So he, you know, the God of the Old Testament is like he's away from uh, them. And then uh, when he turns <laughs> up in bodily form, they reject him and they do kill him. So it's just, uh, it's just terrible, really all the way through i was actually reading the quran today and it's interesting the bit that i was reading it actually talks about um oh no it doesn't talk about this bit yeah it does it talks about salt it talks about how uh god allah uh, basically gave them salt but the reason they gave them salt in the quran is because they wanted them to go out and fight because they were saying they were saying to samuel look you uh, you prophet, who's going to t help us to go and fight? Well, you know, we need uh, a king. So they gave them Saul. It's really strange. It's like totally out of the biblical character because there's nothing about that here. This is about actually um, the Jews rebelling against God and wanting their own king. It's nothing to do with going out to fight. It's very strange. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah it is. It's really, really weird. It is weird. Yeah, and then it goes and talks about David, but I can't remember. But it's totally out. It's just made up. That's how I see it. So then in verse 38, we've got two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. So he was even saving souls at this point. We don't see the narrative, but the awesome thing is when we go to Luke 23. Yep. Luke 23, uh, verse 39 to 34. Can you do it, mate? Yeah, I've got it, yeah. Then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Assured, Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I, lo I love this bit because it's just like one sinner one sinner, two sinners, but one of them repents and turns to Jesus and on that day does nothing other than trust in him and goes to paradise. 
Um, it's one of the reasons why I believe that when we die, we go to paradise because I don't understand why it would only apply to the thief. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that when we do die, we, uh, we go to paradise and we go to be with the Lord. Uh, but I love this section because it just goes to show that you don't have to do anything to go to heaven other than trust in Jesus and, you know, be remorseful for your sin and turn to him. Um, so it's like a beautiful bit of scripture. And, and he said today, he didn't say in a million years, he said today you're going to be in paradise. Uh, so, yeah, I just find that really amazing. Uh, and then I've got the next bit highlighted, which is you who destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself, which he did. You know, God saved him three days later. He rose again from the dead. And 41, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders. So the highest religious figures still continue to mock him. And even though they delivered him to death, are still mocking him, even when he's on the cross. You know, suffering all these things, probably covered in blood, looking absolutely like a mess. It just, honestly, it beggars your belief. Like, where are the ethics and morals of these religious leaders? They're sadly missing. It's just bonkers. And then in verse 43, they said, he trusted in God, let him deliver him, which he did three days later. <laughs> you know, he, he had to die to show that he had power over death. So God uh, delivered him three days later. And then we've got Jesus actually dying on the cross. So let's go through this section. So I'll do the first paragraph. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, le sakamatai. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, you did that well, blimey. I just made it up. Some, <laughs> some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. <clears throat> and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice yielded up his spirit then behold the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earthquakes and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after the, his resurrection they went into the holy city city and appeared to many so when the crema centurion when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and these things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Josie, the mother of Zebedee's sons. So, uh, yes, yeah, so brave he's... women, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's some brave women. I like the way the men, the men run away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, cowards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, the women turned up and looked from afar. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. So, the first paragraph I've got the six hour into the night vow. What's interesting is the Jewish calendar is different to ours, uh, but also so is their time. Their uh, time in these days, the first hour was like, well, zero hours, like six o'clock in the morning. So when it says the six hour to the ninth hour, it's actually from 12 o'clock midday to three o'clock in the afternoon. So Jesus was on the cross between 12 and three o'clock. And um, which, what's interesting is that at three o'clock, that's when they would do the evening sacrifices as well. So as Jesus was being sacrificed on the cross, they were doing the evening sacrifices. Now, there was a darkness all over the land. And I've heard people say that there was a solar eclipse, but that's not true. Because when you have the Passover meal, it has to be a full moon. And you can't have a solar eclipse when there's a full moon because it's on the other side of the earth. So ah, it was a, yeah. yeah. It was a supernatural event from God to bring darkness onto the whole of the earth at that time. 
So it must have been quite eerie at the time. And then he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, I think I'm going to read to you Psalm 22, 1 to 22. So let's go and have a look at Psalm 22. Have you got it on your bookmark? For some reason, I haven't got that one. Oh, hang on. I don't know why I haven't got that. No, I've got Samuel, Luke, Corinthians, Philippians, Luke, again, Isaiah, Samuel. I, I don't know what's happened here. So what Something was it? to look forward to. If you Google it, Psalm 22, NKJV, New King James Version. 20. I'm already there in my Bible. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Technology is not what it's cracked up to be. No, no. <laughs> no so what is it? Psalm 20. Psalm 22. 22. Okay, I'm going to finish it. Verse 22. Have you found it? Hang on. Because it, it's got... I don't understand this. Psalm 20... And it goes to verse nine, and I try and turn the pe- like you can turn the page with a sign. It goes to twenty one. Yeah. I don't hold on. I don't understand. So, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, I don't understand. It hasn't got the full verse. I don't. I don't know why. Oh, have you got a real Bible? <laughs> <laughs> I was doing so well this week as well. You know. I know. You were well played. So it? it was Psalm 20, what was it? Psalm 20. Psalm 22. The way they've set this out is really weird. I'll, I'll just go back to Google and put it in. Yeah. I was doing so well. I thought, this week I thought, this is not going to happen this week. <laughs> right, here we go. Right, okay. Twenty. Yeah, I'm going to read, read into verse 22. If you follow with me, remember yeah, that on okay. the other sheet, Jesus was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it starts off in verse 22 saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season... And I am not silent. Remember, there was darkness over the land at that time. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip and they shake their head, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb and made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls from Basham have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, pot shard, and my tongue clings to my jaw, and have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. O my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword. My (coughs) precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So it's just like 
it's a revelation of Jesus, you know, in the suffering and the things that he was going through. I think when David was writing this, I think he was under the power of the Holy Spirit because it was just like a reference, basically, to how Jesus would be feeling at the time when he was on the cross. Completely yeah, deserted. I'm just thinking, he, he, there's certain parts of it, he, he, yeah, it's like Jesus would have could have wrote them, you know. Mm. They cast lots, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's as if, like, because it, it, it's Jesus, isn't it, what happens to him. Mm. Yeah, it's quite amazing. So um, they divide my clothes and cast lots of my garment. Mm. Do you know when I was looking for this? You know, you know what I was doing? I went to Psalm twenty, and I was looking for verse twenty-two, and I thought there isn't a verse twenty-two. I don't know what I was thinking. I went to Psalm twenty, and Psalm twenty's only got nine verses. Yeah. And I was getting confused because I was looking for verse twenty-two of Psalm twenty. I don't know why. So I don't, it's been a long day, mate. It's been, it's been a long worse, day. I've done worse things. That's fine. It's been, it's been a long day, you know what I mean? But we got there in the end. We got there, yeah. So yeah. I'm going back to the yellow sheet, and it says in verse 47 that there was some that stood there, and uh, they heard them that said, this man is calling for Elijah. That's what they thought they heard, that he's calling for Elijah. And the reason for that is because God is Eli, and uh, it sounds like Elijah, which is Elihu. So, uh, they, so they just thought they heard they, him. Oh, yeah, they just sort of heard what he was saying. Wrong. I should imagine that he wasn't very, you know, he wasn't that, he couldn't really understand him that much because of his, uh, you know, his injuries and the everything. State he was in, yeah. Yeah. So then his uh, spirit left his body, he yielded up his spirit. So his body's dead at this point and his spirit's just gone where it's gone. And uh, then in 51, it says the veil, which is the curtain of the temple, which was a massive piece of fabric. It was a huge piece of fabric. It was uh, like nine by nine meters long by about 18 meters high, huge piece of fabric, el elaborate in detail, gold and all sorts of things. And uh, it basically separated the, uh, the holy place of the temple to the holies of holies, the most holy place. And the holies of holies was a square box room it was, it was a cube in dimensions, and inside of there should have been the Ark of the Covenant, which had the tablets from uh, Moses um, inside there. But the Ark of the Covenant was lost. So Herod's temple, what's interesting is, inside the holies of holies, it was an empty box. There was nothing in there. But it, was, it had this curtain in front of it, this massive curtain. And the curtain was ripped from the top to the bottom, which it's impossible to rip that curtain anyway because, like, it's a really thick curtain. But it was ripped from the top to the bottom because man couldn't do it from the bottom to the top. It had to come from the top to the bottom, like, you know, God sort of ripped it. And the message is that basically um, the holies of holies is now not separated by a veil. You can have access to the holies of holies through Jesus Christ. Anyone can have access now. So that it's been torn, this idea that, you can't approach God. You can't get to the holiness of holies without being perfectly pure by the sacrifice of lambs, because now we have the sacrifice of Jesus that makes us perfectly holy, and therefore we can have access to the holiness of holies. So that's that's what's going on here, really. Um, did you remember Ali G? He used to call the police the Babylons. Have you heard of that? Can you remember Ali G? No. All right. Okay. I don't. I, well, I don't know. He used to. I'd never, I was never into it. I, I don't know why he used to, he used to annoy me, but you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Praise I, I, God. I know my brother used to like him, but um, yeah, I, I used to like him, when I, but you know, I was like, uh, I wasn't Christian. And yeah. um, he used to call the police the Babylons, and this caught on. People in the UK were calling the police the Babylons. When it came from the Jamaicans, <laughs> they used to call the police the Babylons, but actually, it comes from scripture because the Babylons came into Israel took the people, people captive and took all of their possessions as well. So the idea is you call the police the Babylons because they come and take all your stuff away and come to oh, take right. you away and put you into captivity. So uh, that's why the police sometimes are called the, the Babylons. The Babylons. That was, was interesting, yeah. So uh, then I've got highlighted in 52. Many bodies of the saints who have fallen asleep had been raised but this was after his resurrection. 
So not only was Jesus resurrected, but actually a lot of the saints as well from the past were resurrected. Probably some people that people knew, you know, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So I think that it was just like Jesus' resurrection, the saints resurrected, which must have been really comforting because it meant that not only did Jesus resurrect, but so did some of the saints. And it must have been like, well, Jesus had power over death. And it was also demonstrated for the other saints. I mean, this shouldn't surprise us because like Lazarus was raised from the dead. So these other saints were raised from the dead as well. But what's interesting about it is when we think about it, these saints may have been dead for like 50, 100, 500 last week or whatever years. Do you know what I mean? They may have been dead for a long time. And I would think that their body probably wasn't a real physical body. I think it was probably more spiritual, like a spiritual body. And the Bible describes Jesus's resurrection body as a spiritual body. It couldn't have been physical because when you think about it, like Jesus did strange things, like he, he walked through walls in the one account of the yeah. Gospels. I think it, it's probably like, it's probably like something we couldn't imagine. Like, yeah. like it's a spiritual body, but it's probably not spiritual as we're thinking because you could touch him, couldn't you? Like, yeah, it's like because physical. Like, I like it's in the spiritual. Bible, like they they could touch Jesus where the nails had been. So it was mm. he was like a flesh and blood human, but yeah. it was a flesh and blood human who could just like appear and then disappear. And then you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, and, and then he, he could you could recognize him one minute, and not recognize him another. You know, like yeah, exactly. I've got some. Uh, verses here i've got 1 corinthians 15 42 to 49 do you mind yeah, if i read that. it I yeah yeah you read it yeah i love this for these verses because it's like uh, our hope for the future really and uh i'm really looking forward to this bit so 1 corinthians 15 which remember starts off with the gospel but interestingly it talks a lot about the resurrection as well so in verse 42 to 49 it says this. So also in the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption in sin, you know, in death. It is raised in incorruption in immortality, you know, lives forever. It is sown in dishonor, in ugliness, there's something bad about it. It is raised in glory, it's perfect, it's completely different to how it was sown. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, which is what we know. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, which is our body that we're in. And there is a spiritual body, which is the resurrection body that we're looking forward to. I'm just paraphrasing all this. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, which is Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was of the earth made of dust. It's physical, like how we understand all of our science is based on this stuff. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the, main, as the, was the man made of dust, so also those who are made of dust. And as it was the heavenly man, so also those who are heavenly. And as we are born in the image of man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So like, we're born we're in the image of God, yes, but we're in the image of man. But like when we're raised from the dead, we become in the image of a spiritual heavenly man, which is Jesus. We become uh, like have you know, a supernatural body. I would love to look up the translation of that word that's translated spiritual body, because I think you probably better understand what it's saying. Mm, yeah, yeah. Sounds like, that, like what, what was the Greek? What was the word they were using in the original language? You probably have a really yeah. a better understanding of what the verse is saying. It's a good idea. When we're finished here, remind me when we're finished praying, and I'll quickly go and have a look on my yeah. iPad because I've got a Greek lexicon, so we can. Oh, wow, you know, cool, yeah. yeah, it's a good idea. So then we've got Philippians 3 20 to 21. Do you want to read that? Yep, I'll just scroll down to 20. You want? Oh yeah, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await our saviour from there, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Yeah, so when he comes, he's going to transform us so that our body is like his glorious body. It's going to be like this amazing spiritual body. So uh, I think these guys that resurrected, you know, the, the other people that resurrected, the saints, I think they probably ascended maybe to heaven. I don't think they stayed around because I, I don't understand that. Like, why would we die twice? You know, I think we die once and then we receive a spiritual body. That's the evidence of the resurrection. So I think like they appeared, but then they ascended to heaven or they just disappeared or something. I don't know, but... I don't think that they died again. I don't think they went into old age because when we resurrect into our spiritual body, it's going to be like Christ's glorious body, eternal, never dying, never suffering, never any pain, that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, something to look forward to. But, you know, I, I know, I'm sorry, I'm going off the topic again, but the, the reason I want to look up that word is because the English word spirit makes you think of something that's invisible and it's like it, it's some, you know, you become a spirit when you die, you know, no, but you become a spirit when you're not alive, but Jesus is alive, isn't he? Yeah. Am I making sense? That's why I want to look at what that word yeah, means. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We'll have a look. Uh, and then it's got that, you know, the, the centurion and those with him. So an enemy of the people was actually saying, truly, this is the son of God. So it's like he was converted. And then we're getting to the end now, two sections left. So we've got Jesus buried in Joseph's tomb. Okay. Uh, uh, do you no, want when, to do Yeah, yeah I'll do it. Sorry. Uh, yeah. please. Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had he had hewed out of rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Yeah, so this Joseph guy, it says, a rich man from Arafia named Joseph, so he's a rich guy. He was mega rich because like, he had his freshly cut tomb in Jerusalem, which like to have a freshly cut tomb, your own tomb with a stone and all that, you've got to be rich to be able to do that. You know, you know, you know like, I've heard, you know, you know, like, you know there's, there's this common thing. People think that like, you know, Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, but I can't find that in the Bible. No, neither can I. No. <laughs> I can't find that in the Bible. It said she's like demon possessed, wasn't she? Like, yeah, but yeah, and, and no, he cast demons. No out. evidence that she was a prostitute. Some people no, no. say it was because of the um, the perfume that she was using to anoint Jesus, the expensive nard or whatever it is. And they were saying that she was using that to basically try to hide the scent of her sin or something like that. But I think it's all tradition. I just think it's made. But up. yeah, because because I, I, I was reading the gospel one. I, I, I was reading the Gospels, and I, I could, I, you cannot find it. It's not there. No. It's not in the Bible. It's not there. No, so I'm wondering not. where, where, where has this come from? Because it's not, it's not there. No, I think it's just hearsay and made up it's tradition. I can't see. Yeah, it, it must be. Yeah, because I think it's come probably come. Yeah, it is tradition. Yeah, mm. I think people just tend to fill in the blanks, don't they? You know, like. People do, but then part of me wonders if it's come from the Catholic Church. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. No, no. 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 So, anyway, th this Joseph guy, he was a proper rich guy. He had his own tomb right next to Jerusalem. That's where he was planning to die. But he gave it to Jesus. That's, like, amazing. So this rich guy, because, like, we say the poor come to Christ, but sometimes we forget the rich. This was a rich guy. And not only that, he had a lot of prestige as well because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. Do you remember that when Jesus went before the Sanhedrin, I said there was something like, I can't remember how many people, but it, was a, it goes into the tens. There's a lot of people there, and probably Joseph was a member of that group as well and didn't agree with what was happening. So I've got some scriptures here, which is Luke 23. 
2350, is it? 50 to 51, yeah. Hold on, I'm just scrolling down. Here we go. So, <clears throat> now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not cons cons consented to their decision and deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. So he was a council member, which means Sanhedrin, it's just translation. And uh, he didn't agree with their decision. So it's like he was there, but he didn't agree with what they were doing. So yeah. he, he was at the tops of the tops, really rich, gave his tune to Jesus and obviously became a disciple of Jesus. So sometimes we think that the Jews were all, like the Jewish leaders were all bad. But not all of them, do you know what I mean? There were people there as well that were. Yeah, ah, so, interesting. So we've got Isaiah 53, <laughs> verse 9 as well. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. H how could you not think Jesus is not the Messiah? I know. It's just. I, it's, it's, it's just. How could, if you're a Jew, how could you read this? It's all over the place. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's not even like, it's not even like, it's like, um, it's like, I don't it's, it's, it's so blatantly obvious there, it's there. Mm. I don't understand how you could not, how you could deny it. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, think... it's in the Psalms, it's in Isaiah, it's all, it's in the, it's all over the place. And it it's, is. it's like, it's it's like um it's so like that they put nails in my hand. I had done no wrong. I was led like a lamb to the slaughter, you know. And it things like that. Ha I don't I don't know, but I'm I'm no. ranting. But <laughs> no, no, you're not. No, it, even like Samuel, where that you know they rejected uh, God as king, so they ended up with Saul, and here they are at the end rejecting God as king again. Yeah. No. And then they were waiting for a king, a liberator, to come to them, and it was God. Yeah, they rejected him. It's just, it's just all over the scriptures, like you say. I think, just, I think it's probably. I like, you know, people say like that. Use that word hard-hearted. I think that's what it is. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you just don't want to accept it, you're, you're just going to deny. It. No, no amount of evidence is going to persuade you, is it, Mike? No, it's not. Even if you go and heal lepers or heal the blind. Yeah. You know, it's just insane. Yeah, but that's what like the way they, they, they just they come up with like the most like like you know when jesus heals it's like it's the hard heartedness is oh he must be doing it in the power of demons you know mm. oh you know they're just they're just dismiss, they're just explain it away don't they like they do yeah it's terrible isn't it yeah so terrible so th this guy he became uh a disciple of Jesus, and like you just read in the scripture, not only was he buried with the wicked, because most people being buried in that area probably were wicked, looking at the mass population of the people that were rejecting Jesus, and yet he was buried with the rich at the same time. Do you know what I mean? So he had this yeah. rich tomb that he stayed with. And then in verse sixty, I've got um, that he rolled a large stone against the the door of the tomb. And what's interesting about this, I wish I had to put a picture of it. I, a lot of the tombs, they had like a ramp and this massive stone on top and the stone would roll down the ramp to make it easier. You'd like take out a wedge or something. It would roll down, boom, seal. Nobody could mess with it. To move that stone was extremely heavy. You had lots of people to be able to roll the stone away or to take it away from the section. But, you know, it, because it's sort of like cut in probably to the ground a little bit, I think that's hard as well. So this... This tomb is completely sealed with this stone. To move it, you'd need a lot of people uh, to do that. And then we've got on verse 62, that Pilate sets guard. So uh, do you want to read the first paragraph? Yeah. <clears throat> on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember... While he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise. Therefore, command the tomb, that tomb be made secure until the third day. Least his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. 
So the last deception will be the worst than the first. So Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know. Uh, so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. So, um, you know, they sealed the stone and it, they actually sealed the place with like a Roman seal, which was like a waxy sort of thing with ribbons or what have you. But like no one is going to mess with that that place because it's guarded by Romans. It's probably guarded by the Sanhedrin soldiers if they're there as well, although I think the Romans probably did it. But you wouldn't mess with them. You know, they've got swords. You've got this huge stone before the uh, before the actual tomb itself. So it's like no one's going to steal the body. No one's going to get involved with that. And if a Roman <laughs> with a Roman seal on the tomb, on the tomb, if they failed at their task of guarding it for three days, they would face execution. Do you know what I mean? And that's how strict it was as a Roman soldier. You had to go through with your orders. So, um, yeah, it's just uh, just a, a real secure place that nobody can mess with. And yet Jesus rose from the dead. And we know he rose from the dead because everything went like wildfire. They wanted to kill all of the Christians. They had to flee to different places because everything was just blowing up like crazy. You know, so there's definitely something that cracked off. If he died and stayed in the tomb, it'd be the end almost of Christianity. It certainly wouldn't have exploded or had a reason to explode like it did. I've heard, so I've heard been... somebody, I think, I, I remember listening to, I can't remember who it was. I don't know if I read it or it was a part of a sermon or something, but I remember somebody saying, <clears throat> The early Christians, if Jesus hadn't died and risen from the dead, and if they hadn't seen it, they wouldn't have been willing to give their lives up. Mm, yeah. You know, if, if they hadn't have seen, you know, if they if yeah. they didn't if they really didn't believe what if they had any that little of bit of doubt, they wouldn't have like be ready to, to like sacrifice themselves, would they? Like, mm. I also like take that as well and add on to it that the whole of Matthew, what we're reading at the moment, wasn't written till later. They couldn't say like, oh, we've scrambled in all of these scriptures and all this sort of thing to make it look perfect. Look, here's the documentation. That wasn't written till much later. Instead, yeah. they were being thrown to lions and burnt as Roman candles and sent out from where they were to go to different regions to spread the gospel. Something massively significant must have happened, might we say. Exactly, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the reason why they were guarding the tomb was because they knew that he was going to raise from the dead. Because not only, like, for example, uh, Daniel, we looked at it a couple of, I think it was last session or the session before, we said the Son of Man was coming from the clouds and his kingdom would be an eternal kingdom. So they knew that this, this king, this Messiah, it needed to be an eternal kingdom. It just couldn't die in the stone, you know, in the tomb. It needed to continue on. And we've got other verses as well, like Psalm 16, 10. Have you got that? Um, hold on, New King, New King James. Psalm 16, 10. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> For you will not leave my soul in shoal, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Yeah. So you will not leave my soul in Shahal, which is that death place with the two chasms where Lazarus and the rich man was. Yeah. And you will not let my body see in corruption. So he needed, you know, he went down to Shahal, as we know, but he took the captives up back to uh, paradise. That's how I see it anyway. But the point is this scripture is saying that he's not going to be stayed dead. So they knew that it was an eternal kingship that they were looking for. And that's one of the reasons why they wanted the tomb guarded. And then we've got Isaiah 53, 10. I... Hold on. Isaiah 53, 10. <clears throat> Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of, of the Lord will prosper in his hand. 
Yeah. So he has been put to grief and uh, he's made his body an offering for sin, which is like dying. And yet he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. So he's going to prolong his days and he's going to see his seed, which I think the seed is like, uh, to see his seed, I think that's like the seed of the gospel and actually seeing the fruit of that and the, uh, the amplification of it. Uh, which is like the harvest that we're all coming towards at the end of the days when it comes in on the clouds. That's really everything. And then on the very last page, uh, well, actually, let's quickly go through it because that'll be interesting. Let's have a look at what Matthew 27 is roughly about. So Jesus was handed over to Pontius Pilate. Jesus, Judas killed himself because he recognised it was all a bit of a sin, uh, <coughs> as did the chief priest because they didn't want the money from him. Uh, Jesus uh, faces Pilate on the treason of King of the Jews. He says he is, <laughs> but he be quiet about it, uh, which most people wouldn't be. Uh, the people, they chose their sin. They chose Barabbas over Jesus, even though the governor knew that he was in innocent, still sent him to be uh, crucified. And then the soldiers completely mocked him, and he was scourged as well, put on a cross. Everybody was, was mocking him, including the chief priests, they were all mocking him. And the accusation was that this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So they're looking up at this battered bloke who is the son of God, he's proved it, and, uh, you know, he is God. And yet they still continue to mock him. It's unbelievable. So he dies on the cross, and, um, you know, there's some resurrected guys so the veil is torn in two. Um, and then he's buried in a rich man's tomb, who was one of the people on the council to convict uh, Judas as part of the Sanhedrin. And uh, Pilate goes and sets a guard over there and they seal the tomb so that nobody, nobody can mess about with it. Uh, and then obviously we know what happens in the next chapter. He raises again from the dead, miraculously, even though they've guarded the tomb. So your homework is to continue on trying to study those scriptures because next week there's a test. Uh, but don't worry if you fail miserably. What do you mean by test? I... Well, I want to see how many of the scriptures you've remembered. <laughs> okay. You, you've had weeks on this. Now, I did uh, record on Gospel Van the scriptures. I just read them out. I've got a short video. I think it's about one or two minutes long. Uh, and I figured maybe a good piece of homework is to just try and listen to it every day. Yeah. Because when you, yeah. when you do that, and try to guess what's being said next. Try to guess what's being said next. You've got the scriptures on the piece of paper anyway. But if you have that with you and you're trying to guess what I'm going to say next on the video, I think it will help you to remember. Because the test oh. is going to be a bit like this. You're not going to have the scriptures before you, but I want you to read them. And if you don't know, I'm going to try to read it to you. And whenever you feel like you know where it's roughly going, just continue the rest of the sentence for me. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So try and recall yeah. as much as you can. Uh, okay. I also don't know those scriptures. I'm trying to learn them myself at the moment. Uh, but I'm just going to listen to this video every day. And I think that might help me a little bit. And then that's it. Are, are you happy with that? You, yeah, that? I'm happy with that. Yep. Right, shall we end in prayer? Yep. Okay. Do you want to lead? Uh, no, I, I, I can never, I, I'm not good at thinking of words to say on the spot. <laughs> and neither am I, okay. So let's do it. <laughs> Lord, uh, we thank you for this time. Um, Lord, it's terrible how they treated you. And to be honest, we're responsible for the way that they treated you because we ourselves have sinned. And Lord, you had to go for all of that. And although you didn't want to, although you said... Father, if you can take this cup away from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Lord, we say the same thing. We find it amazing the things that you did and how you gave yourself up so that we may live. So, Lord, we pray that we do things according to your will, that you enable us to do whatever it is that you want us to do. Because, Lord, we just want to please you because we're so grateful for what you've done for us. Lord, we thank you. Uh, I pray that uh, the last session will be really good. And uh, 
Lord, I pray that you help us and enable us to seek and save the lost um, on the mission that you've given us whilst we're here on the earth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.